be seated. Good morning, church. My name is Riley Pickrell. For anyone in here that does not know me, I get to serve our amazing campus ministry here at the Lehigh Valley Church uh, with the amazing Kelly Oburn, who you hear yelling very loudly in the back. And uh, I get the honor of preaching this morning, and uh, I hope everyone's looking forward to the holiday this week, Thanksgiving, this upcoming Thursday, getting ready to eat some food. Kurt will be cooking his 24th turkey, uh, and it's going to be a good week. I'm very excited. I'll be going back to the great land, the golden state, um, the travel destination of 2022, I've heard in some places. That's not true. Ohio is where I'm from. But I'll be driving back there later on today and enjoying time with family. But uh, in the meantime, uh, this morning we will be going uh, back to Luke as we work through that uh, in our sermon series on mission. So if you guys want to be turning over to Luke chapter 6, I'm going to go ahead and go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray as we, as we approach your word this morning that, God, you can say exactly what you want us to hear. Help us to get from it and leave this building ready, uh, Lord, to go to the world to make a difference, to change it for you and to change it your way. God, we love you. I pray that you speak through me. And I ask this all in your son's awesome name. Amen. And as you guys are turning there, I actually have a, a quick story. Maybe kind of quick. Not really that quick. It's kind of long. But anyway, a few years ago, I cooked my first turkey in an oven. So many of you know, I used to work on a barbecue food truck back in Cincinnati. It's where I came from before I moved here to the Lehigh Valley. And on that food truck, we cooked a lot of turkeys. Like every Thanksgiving, we'd get orders in. We'd be doing dozens upon dozens of turkeys. And, but two years ago, I got to cook my first turkey ever without a smoker in an, in an oven. So I was thinking, this is going to be a cinch. I know this game. The turkey game's not new to me. I've done this before. Level one, this is going to be easy. Um, but just to be sure, to make sure the turkey turned out well, because we were going to slice it up and serve it to, uh, make plates and serve it to the homeless in Allentown, uh, I wanted to make sure it was good, that it turned out well. So I looked up a few recipes online. I watched YouTube videos, and you know, I found the Alton Brown uh, version of cooking a turkey, which is a great way. I highly recommend it. Really, with anything, Alton Brown is amazing. But I found his way, and so I, I looked up his method. I wrote it all down just to be sure that this turkey was going to turn out perfectly. And so the day came, and I had my everything ready, and I followed all of his instructions. Well, most of his instructions I followed. I did the 24-hour brine, which is you put the turkey in, in kind of like a salt bath, and it, and it moistens the meat, and it makes it also very flavorful. And I did that for 24 hours. Check. I started the turkey off at a high temperature to give it that golden brown crust, and it also will help retain moisture later on in the cook. I did that. Check. I then dropped the, the temperature midway through the cook to make sure that everything was cooking gently and it was going to come out like actually good. I followed that instruction. Check. I made the, the Alton Brown way also includes doing a, what he calls the, the turkey triangle, which is a, a piece of tin foil that it's kind of like a breastplate that you put on top of the turkey to make sure that the, the breast meat doesn't overcook and get dry because the rest of the turkey cooks a little slower. I did that. Check. And I followed everything ex except for one thing. Uh, there's one thing Alton Brown recommends and it's, it's having a, a digital thermometer that you put and probe it into the turkey to make sure as the cook is going on, it's going to read the inside without you actually opening up the oven so that you know that it reaches an internal temperature that's safe to eat. So I was like, with all my years, I, I think I'm just going to know. I'm just going to know when the turkey's ready. I'll open up the oven, check it just for good measure, and it's going to turn out good. So I do it that way. I open up the, right when it was the time, I was like, you know, it's probably be ready. I open up the oven. I probe it. It's, it's a little low. I can't serve it that way. That's dangerous. So shut the oven. I wait a few minutes. I do it again. I probe it. Oh, it's still a little low. Shut it again. I repeat that process. 10 to 12 times, um, and uh, what turned, what should have been maybe a two and a half hour cook was more like a four hour cook, and it finally gets to 161 degrees, which is where you want it, and I, I take it out, and I let the bird rest, and what you should do to all meat after you cook it, you shouldn't just cut right into it or it loses all its moisture, and I do everything, and then I get ready to carve it so we can start plating it, and I take my knife, and I put it right on top of the breastbone to start cutting into the breast meat, and 
I know I done messed up. It felt like I was cutting into a tire. <laughs> that I had dried the turkey out. Um, luckily, someone else made a turkey, so we mixed the meat a little bit, and uh, it turned out fine still, um, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the fact that I knew the right way to do it meant nothing if I didn't actually listen to the instructions and do it. And today, as we go to Luke, we're going to be reading the, the section that is right after Jesus' sermon on the plain, uh, where he, he really gives his, his manifesto that this is the new kingdom that he's ushering in. What the Jews were looking forward to, he is the one bringing it to them. They've been looking for it for millennia, and Jesus is now ushering it in. He's laying forward kind of like the bylaws, that if you're going to be a part of his new kingdom, this is the way you are to live. And the two parables we'll look at uh, don't have much to do with the manifesto, but more to do with what we then go and do with Jesus' teachings. So we'll be starting in Luke 43. And it reads in verse 43, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its fruit. These two words, good and bad, I'm going to pause right there, uh, have to do more so with fit and unfit to eat. So bad isn't so much like rotten fruit. It's more like an acorn. You know, that's the fruit of an oak tree, but it's, you don't eat acorns. Now, let's keep going. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So what Jesus is saying is, is kind of simple here, that certain plants make certain kinds of fruits. My plant that sits on the window at my house isn't going to produce anything other than what it's already doing, which is nothing. It doesn't grow really fruit. It just grows leaves. But during the off season, it's not going to say to itself, you know what, in the spring, I'm going to make a kiwi. Yeah. Riley's never going to see that coming. And I wouldn't, <laughs> because that's not what it does. Plants don't change how they work. And what he's saying is that certain plants make certain fruits. And followers of Jesus live a certain way. That you can't separate those two. That if you are a follower of Christ, your life reflects it. You produce Jesus' fruit. Uh, the way I treat people in an emotionally charged circumstance, that matters. That if someone says something inconsiderate, which never happens during the holidays, um, the way you treat them and the way you respond, that matters to Jesus. The way you use money, your lifestyle in every corner, all these things matter. That a true follower of Jesus produces a certain life. And Jesus is calling the crowd here, really kind of in a way, to, to make a decision. Will you trust him? Jesus' ways Jesus' methods, this new kingdom he's ushering in, will you trust his words? Because if you do, then your life will be about producing what Jesus' life was all about, that you will actually do it. And our beliefs in our lives can never be separated, but it's, it's something that we, we do. We, we separate these things. Um, today, you know, we're really good at presenting the parts of our life that we want people to see. That's what social media is, like Instagram, Facebook. You show the world exactly the manicured parts of your life you would like to present to them. Or the front yard, nicely manicured. You know, it might look a little cleaner because it's facing the street than the backyard. You might leave, you know, things out in the yard. We show people the parts of life we want them to see. Now, I have kind of a, an illustration here. If I were to say right now, I'm going to point to one of you, and I'm going to be like, you, and I know your name somehow. And what if I was to say, you right now, we've been following you around, just like the Truman Show. Have you ever seen that movie? And, and your life, we've been filming for the past week, 24 hours a day. And right now, we're going to play it for everyone to see. Your heart might be racing thinking about that scenario. That, one, it'd be kind of creepy, but two, what, what would we see in those moments of alone time? when it's downtime, behind closed doors, is Jesus still the Lord of your life when nobody else is watching? Do you live a, a pure life? You know, maybe you save sex till marriage, but is your dating relationship pure? Do you, do you strive for Jesus' standard or, or a worldly standard? Do you, maybe you don't get drunk, but do, do you get buzzed? Do you see how far you can push it? Are you striving for righteousness, or are you seeing how close can I get that it's not quite a sin? You know, were you evangelistic, 
Do you, do you actually sit down and, and, and really dig with people to help them figure out their relationship with God? How far do you go there? Is your life in every corner actually committed to the words Jesus is calling us to follow? You know, personally, uh, recently I've been learning a lot about my, my finances. Like every person probably in their 20s, you know, I've been listening to the, the Dave Ramsey, you know, his methods. And, and uh, to be honest, I'm not good with money. I'm, I'm very bad with money, actually. I'm, I'm not very responsible, but I'm growing. I'm getting better at it. Um, but it's a section of my life that I've had to really dig and like, okay, if Jesus is the Lord of every corner, then I need to have a life generous toward God. That I can't, I can't separate that. You know, I, to be honest, I, I don't. Ma I have thin margins in a lot of times. Uh, no, contrary to popular belief, no, but what ministers make. But I, I have to be wise with how I spend. So that means I have to think very creatively and think how can I still be generous toward God, but also save for the future and, and build that way. Sometimes I think we have this false dichotomy that I can't do both. Um, and to be honest, in my life, even up to this point, I've given to God what is left over. Um, and it's a little bit, maybe more than most. But is it generous toward God? No, I've been learning those things recently. And that's an area of life. It's, it's not, you know, it's not too personal. But Jesus still must be the Lord of every aspect. And I need to live faithfully in that. Is your life truly one living the sermon on the plain lifestyle? Let's keep reading. Uh, Luke 6, verse 46. It says, and as you turn there, I don't know if you're there already. I'm going to take a while. Verse 46. It says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug deep and laid foundations on a rock. And when the flood came, the torrent struck the house, but could not shake it, because it was built, ugh, built well. But the one who hears my words and does not put them to practice is like a man who built a, his house on ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and it went, or its construction was complete. And anyone who has like construction experience is like probably cringing at the idea of building a house without like a foundation. It's like, why would you do that? Why would you invest all that money to build this house and bring it up and then put it on the ground? Like, that's crazy. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. He's not coming and, you know, giving a good, you know, a bit of advice saying, ah, oh, you know, you should build your life this way. Uh, gee, thanks, Jesus. No, it's not a bit of advice. He's saying, wake up. It's crazy that if you build your life in a way other than his words, it's going to end poorly. It's not going to go the way you expect. And today, I think it's also easy to read into this verse and, and kind of think about the storm and the flood, the torrent that comes um, as, you know, it's, it's the floods of life. Like everybody in their times are going to go through trials. They're going to go through difficult periods of life where following Jesus' words is, is really hard. And, and that's true. I think to some extent, following Jesus, putting his words into practice, you can overcome any circumstance in life. Like you're going to be able to do or get through with God anything. He will bring you through that when you trust his words. And we can think about that story like that. I think it still holds. But most of Luke's readers would not have looked at the flood as, as the things of this life. But it would have been the test that everybody one day will undergo, which is judgment. That one day we will all stand before God. And in that place, it won't matter what we intended to do, what we wanted to do, what we thought about, what verses we memorized. The only thing that will matter is did you do it? Did you put Jesus' words actually into practice in every corner of your life? Jesus, you know, is not just being mean and controversial or uh, overzealous here. It's because he knows the end of our story. He is God. He knows where the paths lead that we are going down. Yeah, it's not, it's not like a, anything, he's not being uh, mean, but it's a plea. It's a loving God or Father begging that if you trust his methods, this is, this is where you're going to end up. You just trust me in this. So do, do you forgive? Do you forgive those who have done you wrong? Do you, do you actually go down that path? Did you really share the great gift of the gospel and in the same proportion that you, you, you've received? Do you see the, how great the gift it is? Do you, do you share it with that same intensity? Did you live generously with money? In your purity, were you pure? Did you live above reproach with alcohol? Were these things actually 
in your life. Jesus is also telling us trusting his ways with dealing with hard circumstances and difficult people, just loving your enemies, that it's, it's like acting with the future in mind. It leads to a good place. That when you treat people the way Jesus is calling you to, it's going to end up well. Hurt relationships will be mended. Character is going to be formed. Life trajectories altered forever. But only if you trust his methods and do it. This is the message Jesus is bringing to the crowd at the Sermon on the Plain and probably also uh, other places as well. And scholars think that it wasn't just one time. He probably gave that same message in multiple locations. And he's also given the same one to everyone in this room today. That if you trust his words in the scriptures, that this will be, you're in the kingdom. If not, then your circumstances, your, or your, your path is already set. Each of us is called to be a prophet where we are. Actually, you're turning over to 1 Samuel 3. We have a story where we just kind of lived out in, you know, in real time. In 1 Samuel, it's, it's the beginning of the book. And, and Samuel, who's a great prophet of Israel, he's actually the one that, um, that ordained, that, that brought up Saul and, and David, that, that anointed them to be king. And uh, this is when he's young. He's not yet a, a prophet. Um, but it's the story where God calls him in the middle of the night and, and Eli, or not, Eli is the priest. He's the high priest at this time. And, and Samuel is kind of like under his tutelage. He's being raised and trained by Eli. And it's the story where, where God calls him in the middle of the night and says, Samuel, Samuel. And he wakes up and he goes to Eli and Eli's like, nah, bro, it wasn't me calling you. Go back. And then he does it again and repeats the process. And eventually Eli's like, maybe God's trying to say something to you. So Samuel goes back, he wakes up when he hears his name, and he says, God, I'm here. Say what you want to say. And God gave him a message, and, and it wasn't really a good one. It was, it was a pretty negative one. And in verse 11, 1 Samuel 3, it reads, The Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. At the time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to his house, or the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning, and he opened the doors of the, of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. I would be too. <laughs> it's not a good vision. And imagine that. Eli, this is the guy that's been training him, that's been teaching him. I'm, I'm sure that there was also a good relationship there in many extents, um, or in many ways. And Samuel had a decision here. Do I be a prophet or, or do I cower? Do I choose not to say the hard thing? And, and we get a great illustration between these two characters where Eli was, was a man of God, was a priest, had two sons and raised them up in the Lord, but as time went on, they, their path veered. Um, they would blaspheme against God. They, they would, uh, as, as it says in the Old Testament, they would uh, uh, treat the Lord's sacrifices with contempt. Um, there, wasn't some, there was some bad things going on. Eli didn't correct them. He didn't step in and make the corrections necessary for his sons. Samuel, on the other hand, is given an opportunity, a chance. Does he step up and actually be a man of God? and tell Eli what he needs to hear. And he does. As you read the rest of that story, Samuel steps up and it really does prove that he's worthy of being a prophet of Israel and shows that he can do that. And we're going to face that same choice today. Will we listen to Jesus and live his words, keeping his words in our life, even in the moments that are difficult or are hard? Um, and in these moments, we'll choose to be a prophet or not. Um, one thing I think that makes a prophet a prophet and a false prophet a false prophet isn't just that they teach incorrectly the false prophet, it's that they also teach incompletely. That, that if someone or someone who in their life they do most things God's way, except, except here, except with my money um, or my relationship, yeah, that's, that's too personal, not here. I'm not going to let God into that. You know, I, I didn't disregard all of Alton Brown's instructions. Just, just a few of them. The ones that would have you know, been inconvenient for me. You know, false prophets are masters of really getting people close, but then not saying what needs to be said. What God is trying to say to them. Where is it for you that you're stopping short? 
Is there areas that you're, you, you'll go this far, but not, not here? Uh, you know, not just teaching his sons, but also helping them to live out, just like in Eli's circumstance. You know, are you bearing Jesus' fruit or not? Listening to Alton Brown's recipe completely or, you know, getting to bad turkey? Are you really living the life or just parts of it? It's a question. So for, for people who are visiting today, um, if you're kind of like, yeah, you're kind of on the verge, you feel like half of your life's in, half your life's out, but you want to figure this out. Like you want to be a disciple. Uh, for you this morning, where in, in your life is Jesus calling you to, to trust him, to step out and, and to actually trust his words? Um, is it with the way you deal with stress? Or is it when you're bored or when you're uncomfortable? Where is God calling you to make a faithful decision? Because he's trying to show you he can meet your needs way better than, than how you're meeting them now. Where is it that he's calling you? If you're a new Christian, if you're a member of this church, um, still, God's calling you to grow. Where is it that God's actually calling you to step out? Is it personal righteousness? Is it a life of vulnerability or evangelism? What are the places God is calling you now to grow? Or if, or if you're experienced, if you've been in the kingdom a while, if you've been living this life, you've cooked ma many turkeys in your day, you know, where is it that maybe you're being tempted to loosen your grip? Where is it that you don't really feel the same zeal? Where is God calling you to still call people to a higher standard? Are, are you still calling people to that? Church, let's be, this week, let's, let's examine our lives and see where God is actually calling us to step out and to follow him to completeness, to not, just, uh, to not just be looking at the turkey, to not be opening the door, but to, to, to cook it to fullness. So I hope everyone has an amazing holiday. Um, get some delicious food. And uh, that's all I have this morning. Worship can come back up for one last song and service will be open.